We're finishing the book of Job, and we're starting our section on the needs of grace. Let's pray. Jeremy, Father, we give you thanks, praise, honor, and glory for your great mercy that you have had on us, your sinful and fallen people. We're so thankful that even though we followed our, our father, uh, Adam, the first man, and Eve, the first woman, into sin, that you sent your son to be the second Adam, who perfectly lived according to your law in, a way, in, ways, in all the ways that we could not. And in his grace and his love and his mercy, he exchanged his perfection, his perfect spotless record with us, and took upon himself all of our failures and sins and mistakes. We're thankful for this, Lord, and help us be mindful of it this Lent, not to take your grace and mercy for granted, but to be inspired by it through the reception of your Holy Spirit, to serve and live as you have called us to do. Be with us today in our Bible class. Help our discussions to be edifying and uplifting, and that we continue to learn from your word. In your name we pray. All right. So, the big, ultimate answer from God is here. So remember, we had uh, our young, impetuous um, Elihu, right? Am I getting his name right? I always mix these guys up. Yes. And he, as he's talking, it starts to say that in the background, a storm is approaching. Right? Um, and you'll get to learn a fun theology word today. I know you're really excited about this, right? What that is called is a theophany. There are a lot of theophanies in scripture. The theophany is... A manifestation of God, and it's usually given in different ways. So, like on Transfiguration, what was the theophany of God? This is my son. Listen, where did that voice come from? Well, yeah, but how did God appear? <laughs> A cloud, right? The theophany is the cloud. So, the big cloud that comes in, and the voice comes out of the cloud, right? Um, and so, one of the reasons God does that is if He shows up. Without any sort of mediation, what happens to us? We're done. We're done, right? We can't be in the presence, the unadulterated presence of God. His glory is too much. That's why when even just an angel shows up, what's the first thing they pretty much always have to say? Yeah. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid, right? Don't run away. Don't cower in fear. I'm a good guy, right? So this is this storm is coming. So the storm is God. And here now in chapter 38, we got our answer. We get our answer from God. Okay. So first question on your handout there, a little half sheet handout. How does God begin his response to Job in chapter 38? Well, he chews them out. Job, you're talking, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. He, he chastises him, or as Ron so eloquently put, <laughs> he chews him out, right? He says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? If we put that in sort of lay terms, it's who's speaking stupidly? Right? Yeah, there you go, Kurt. Um, and in this context, who's raising their hand? Joe, right? Joe. Who is this that darkens counsel with words without knowledge? Imagine God showing up in a storm, and that's the first thing he says to you. Whoa. Right. <laughs> okay. And then he follows it up. That's not how it says, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. So if God's asking you to make something known to him, you're in control. Yeah. Because <laughs> there isn't anything that he doesn't know. He knows that, right? Uh, and then what does he begin to do to illustrate this? What does he do? He starts to tell Job everything. That really not the world. Right, right. So what, one of the answers, the big theme here with, uh, with the way Job is talking about the difference between him and his friends, we talked about was the scope of what God is doing and the control that he has and the power and knowledge and wisdom, right? And so what God is doing here is he's saying, let me give you a small taste of the scope by asking you a bunch of tongue-in-cheek rhetorical questions that I know you know nothing about, right? And he's doing that to humble Job is humbling, is being humbled by someone else a pleasant experience? Usually not, right? But is it a good one? Mm -hmm. Often, yes, it is, right? 
otherwise God wouldn't be doing it, right? He's, who is he doing this for? Job. He's doing this for Job, right? He's not doing it to shame Job. He's doing it to humble Job so that Job comes to the truth. Now, Dave, you had something? I'm just going to say what you're saying. Were you there? Were you there? Right. I did yeah. It's almost like he's saying, I don't know how I did it with I. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you wonder, that's a good way to put it. So it's like first four. But where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you? Right. And then he gives it, surely you know. Yes. Yes. Right. There are a couple of places in this response from God where he gets done during this whole section of where were you and here, can you do this? Can you do this? And then at the end he says, surely you know. Right. Surely. It even be coming from a place of love, but it's almost not me. Yeah. You can you can be doing something in love and be snarky. Yeah. I, I love the line afterwards. He goes, declare if you know all this. Right. Because it's like, not only have I just put you in your place, oh, dare to speak up now. You know? Yes. So the, this section of, of God's answer goes from the beginning of 38 to the beginning of chapter 40, and it ends with shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Right. And what did Job say when he was talking to his friends about what it would be like to make his case before God? He said he couldn't. He said, yeah, he said, it's, it's I'm like, I, I really, really, I'm like caught between this desire. Like, I really think I have a case, but I know if I present it before God, it's not going to end well for me. Right. And so God shows up. And it does. This. Well, it does end well for Job, but his immediate uh, response is quite humbling. Right. So. But it, it, even though, oh yeah, run. Just, just a quick thing here, uh, reading all this. The God, you know, he said all these things. Made the cornerstone that of stars uh -huh. and all these things. Yep. I was watching History Channel a few a month or so ago. And there were these people on our scientists, I guess, are saying how everything was born. And they were saying, well, the sun grew up and or this before the sun. The earth did this, the moon did this. But every time they made a statement, they said, but oh, we're not really sure what happened. Yeah. They like, well, you guys crazy or what? Well, that's actually an improvement yeah. for the scientists because at least they're they're not claiming knowledge from science. Right. I mean, if you if you just have science, that's really the answer that you get, right? Because you can they'll say like like if somebody says, Well, it was a big bang, they're like, Well, what caused that? Well, it was these gases and, yeah. and quarks and pulons. Okay, well, where'd that come? And then they'll come and say, oh, you can always say, and where'd that come from? And where'd that, because eventually, whether it's a theistic thing or not, something has to take the eternal place of God, right? And that's really what's being put on display here is God says, like, I'm God, I'm, I am eternal. And not, he's not only saying I created all things, but what else is he demonstrating here? Because one of the, one of the views of God, one of the uh, many different theistic views of God is that he started everything up and then he left. He's still involved. Right. right. He's still directly involved. He's sustaining creation. He's operating it, right? Um, well, there's also a reason why um, the atom, which they thought was the smallest subatomic particle, was called atom. Um, because it was they believe this is the first, this is the beginning. Um, and and you know, and yeah, then they were proved wrong, but right. <laughs> So, but in the midst of all this, so it's snarky, it's tongue in cheek, it's humbling for Job. But did God answer Job's promise? Yes, but not his question. Well, he is answering his question. It's just not the way that Job wants to answer. Well, what do you mean? Which question are you thinking? Job wanted an answer to why. That's what he's getting. But he's only getting an answer of who. That is the answer to why. It's just a really unsatisfying answer from a human perspective. Right? Because the answer to why is within the who, where it's essentially saying, like, he's trying to get him, don't ask that question. That question's irrelevant. The only question that is relevant is who. And if who is taken care of, the why is taken care of. Um, and so he did, right? I mean, if God was purely working with righteous, like a pure righteous justice, would he have even bothered to show up? Probably not. What would he have done to Job? Just, I'm done with that. I'll make a new one. 
right? But God doesn't do that, right? He comes to Job, and notice that movement, right? He doesn't say, okay, Job, in order to get your questions answered, you have to go on this epic journey and meet me at this mountain, right? God comes to Job, and so often is the case with our God, despite his magnitude and the mass of things that he's thinking about and doing, as he then explains to Job, he is the one that approaches, right? So, what does that mean for us? That even if God shows up and the answer he gives is not quite the one you're hoping for, he showed up, he came to you, he heard what you were saying, and he responds, this is mercy right here. It doesn't quite sound like the normal thing you think of with mercy, but this is mercy. <clears throat> because what is he doing for Job? He's setting him back on the right track. He's revealing the truth of the situation to him, which is always a good thing for God to do, right? So whenever in the New Testament it talks about the word of God being good for correction and rebuking and reproof, this is what it's talking about. It's not talking about one-upping people or demonstrating your knowledge over somebody else or using the Bible to just sort of bash people. It's talking about using it to set someone back on the path of truth. Sometimes that's a really pleasant experience because, oh, it's a new thing you've never heard. And sometimes it's an unpleasant experience because then you have to face all the things that you did that now you know are something different than what you taught. Yeah, Jim. So as he's rebuking Joe, he's also challenging him. Like, speak up for yourself. Be a man. You know what I mean? Like, he's challenged me. When you, you have a leg to stand on here. The joke, right. Joe doesn't go for that, right? That's kind of like a test. Well, it's the, it's sort of a double meaning there. So the 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 uh, the phrase at the beginning of thirty eight where it says "dress for action like a man." What that he says is, it twice, but he says it again in forty. Yes, he does. Yeah, and what that means is it's a call to action in this sort of conflict um, in two ways. One, I mean, the literal Hebrew there means to gird your loins, which means like hike up your clothes and tie them down because we're about ready to fight. <laughs> Right. Um, and I thought about bringing in like a, there's a actually kind of really funny article that has pictures of what that actually looks like to do that. Um, but, um, but the other meaning there is what is, what is Job going to do that he ought to do? Because dress for action like a man isn't just like beat your chest and, and, and yell uselessly into the sky. It's do what, do what you ought. And in this case, what is that for Job? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Why didn't listen to what I have to say? <laughs> Sometimes the thing that God calls you to do is to listen, is to be quiet and listen. Right? And so that's what Job does. Um, so we kind of covered two already. The theme for God's answer in 38 to 40 is this. Where were you? If you can do this, please tell me how. Um, uh, and if you can, if you can even understand this, please tell me how. Of course, the answer to all those questions for Job is, uh, right? Um, please don't ask me to do that because I don't have any idea where you can begin, right? And so then, in the end of okay, somebody has a hand up over here. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Of course. Um, yeah. Um, every time I I read this, I, I I try to picture if I created like a model or a toy or something. And it suddenly like got a voice and went, why just make me like this? Why are you putting me in this situation? I wouldn't have been looking at him like, who are you? <laughs> you know, I made you. Right. Um, well, it's just one of the reasons that God is who he is, is that like in that situation, our response would be to scrap the project and make a new one. Mm -hmm. uh, God doesn't do that. Right? Okay, uh, in chapter 40, here is Job's response. What is Job's response in chapter 40? What does he do in response to all of this knowledge that has been dropped on him by God? Dust and ashes. Did we do that recently? <laughs> yeah, I thought that was very fitting. Mm -hmm. right? and, and when when you got the dust, where is it put? Okay. On our head. Why is it put on your head? Why don't I put it on your hand? On your neck? So you should be mindful. Your foot. Of, you should be mindful of, of your situation. Well, you can't see it. It's on your forehead. Huh? 
A witness for what? That you're a Christian. It's a little more of a specific witness than that. What? That's close. That's close to what it is. What's the most exalted part of your body? Your head. That's where all the really uniquely human stuff happens, right? And so what you would do in the Old Testament, they, they, when somebody is in mourning and they're, they're humiliating themselves, it says they tear their clothes and then they put on a burlap sack and then they sit in ashes, right? Because that's a humiliation. It's a place where like people of honor do not sit, right? And so by putting it on your head, it's, it's not saying you're, you're, you're putting your foot in ashes or you're sticking your hand in ashes, but you yourself are in ashes. Right? Um, now, it's not just that because they, I didn't just like take a bunch of ash and just smash it onto your forehead. I put it in a particular shape. Um, oh, we lost a grape. <laughs> put it over here so it's an expression. Where are we at? Oh, actually, right? So, um, so what does Job do? After he's been humbled, he humbles himself, right? And he does that by sitting in ashes, right? Um, so, not only does he say that, he humbles himself and he sits in ashes, but what does he then say he's going to do? Huh? I said listen. Listen, yeah. And how is he going to listen? closing his yapper, right? He says, I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. I'm not going to talk anymore. Because what's gotten him in trouble so far? Talking, right? So the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and then he says again, dress for action like a man, I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like yours? So in other words, Job thinks that he's putting God on trial with his questions and his cries. And God shows up and says, no, nah, you're the one on trial. Dress for action like man. I'm going to question you. And then you're going to give an answer to my question. And of course, all of his questions are, who are you to demand this of me? Who are you to claim that I'm in the wrong so that you may be in the right? All right. What's his response to God's challenge in chapter 41? Well, I, I mean, I think that's what the ashes were, right? The ashes are in 42, but 40, chapter 40 was what? Yes. <laughs> but he gets more specific too with his words there. As well. So it's the ashes. Um, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Yeah. So where what what is the New Testament language for I despise myself? What does Jesus say? Huh? Oh no. Huh? No. Well, Job is saying this about himself, so it's being said about the follower of God, despising himself. What is that in New Testament language? Huh? Deny yourself, right? Denying yourself. So that's what Job is doing. He's denying himself. He's not saying I hate myself, but I'm, I am no longer the the important voice here. Um. And he's sort of taking back the things that he's saying by saying this. <clears throat> All right, and then this last one, I, this has sort of occurred to me as I was reading through this, and I've never really thought about this before, but I do think it's very interesting. What is strange about Job's behavior in chapter 42, in particular, with his family members? So this is after verse 10. So the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. So the Lord also rebukes his friends and basically says, I'm only going to have mercy on you on account of Job and his intercession on your behalf, but you still have to make a sacrifice to me to make up for 
misrepresenting me. And, oh, and the bulls. He has to sacrifice bulls for this one. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, they have to sacrifice them. Yeah, but Job, Job is acting almost like the priest doing the, the thing. Yes. Right. So, but and in the, the, the set of that one. Like he's not part of it, but, you know, he yeah. spoke ill of me and represented right. me correctly. Yeah. Yeah, because the stuff that he said about God was true. Right? He was talking about, like, essentially a small version of what God had come with. There's a lot of specific, specific language to it. Um, but there's even something stranger here. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters, and all who had known him before. And they fled with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a, a ring. So, what's weird about Job's behavior? It's very, it's not very uh, of the world. Where's his family been this whole time? They left. Because what did they think happened? They thought he did something wrong and God was judging him, so they got out. And now that he's been restored, they showed up again. How would you respond to a situation like that? How does the world says, oh, well, excuse me. Uh, sure. No, sorry. When I was in need, you left. Get out of here. I went out of that. Where does it say that his health was restored? I was hunting for that. And I saw that his fortunes were restored and his, you know, he eventually, I guess, had more children. And I'm guessing this means with the same lady, because we don't talk about him losing his wife. Pro probably verse 17, the very last verse. I mean, it doesn't say it specifically, but it says, and Job died. An old man and full of days. So if he was in still bad health, he probably wouldn't have been an old man. Would have died at well, 210 or however old yeah. he was. And, and, and the one like in yeah. verse 10, it says that he lived 140 other years. He had to be pushing 60, 65 at the beginning of the story. If he yeah. had grown children who were visiting in each other's homes, right? Sure, sure. It's probably verse 10, actually, I would say that, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job. So fortunes doesn't mean just like wealth, but oh, okay. like all of the misfortunes have been removed and okay. restored. Okay. Um, but Job is actually, he's learned from God's response to him because in his relationship with God, he was like the, the family that left in his time of need, right? He's calling judgment upon God. He's asking for God to, you know, make an account of himself as to why this has happened. Because he's the one in charge. And that's not, that's not the way that relationship works, right? And then God comes and says, like, you have no idea. You've just tried to get into a pool that is far beyond the depth that you're able to even, like, get into, right? Um, but instead of spurning Job and not showing up and ignoring him, he welcomes him. He comes to him, right? And so Job does the same thing with his family. So for some reason, that just stood out to me because, like, if my family left when I was in need and then showed up again when I had a bunch of stuff again, my response wouldn't be to let them in my house or, you know, have kind of more food. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, the other thing that's interesting here, and I, um, I looked to see if there was anything odd with the Hebrew, and I was surprised there's not a lot of commentaries that make much of um, verse 11 here when it says and they showed him sympathy and comforted him from all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him or you can translate evil as disasters um, one, or, one argument I heard which was I think fairly compelling is that verse is being stated from the perspective of his family who don't really know what's been going on right and so they just they just they just showed up and they think that God did all this bad stuff to him and and he did something, and, and now it's back to good again, right? And so there's, they're, they're calling what God did to him evil or disastrous. Um, there's always this interesting theme in the Old Testament scriptures when God acts in big and scary ways. It's described in, in different ways. Sometimes it's called a terror. Sometimes it's called a wonder. Sometimes it's called a miracle, right? Um, like the common nomenclature for the plagues in Egypt is the ten plagues. But the scriptures actually say those are the wonders of God, right? Um, I don't know if you've seen the, the cartoon, The Prince of Egypt. I think The Prince of Egypt probably, it, it, for my money more than any other production, does the best job of the burning bush scene. And there's a part where, where he says, 
Like, I'm sending you to my people to perform my wonders. Um, and so, like, they don't really know what's been happening. Family. So that was the explanation there. Because there really wasn't a lot of discourse about the particular word in Hebrew there in the commentaries, which sort of surprised me initially. But, yeah, mm -hmm. I had always thought that the um, that his stars uh, and suns were killed because in um, the beginning it says uh, yeah these yeah. are his brothers and sisters not his children oh, okay yeah because his, his 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 first set of children were killed yeah that was part of the tribulation and it says here that his his brothers and sisters all his brothers and sisters. So the brothers and sisters of Job. I guess I am that like Andy also had seven sons and two daughters. Those are those are now again that he's been restored and he has more children okay. after this. But, but you're correct, yeah. You don't really feel the passage of time here, but for them to produce another ten children, this this wasn't an immediate restoration. Correct. It seems like it had to go have some been right. And and also, I mean, so one of the interesting things, and the, this was this point was made in that the Bible Project video, is there, I think, one of the thoughts is there, there are details about Job as a person and his life and family that are intentionally left out because that's not the focus of the book, right? They don't want you to get lost in the weeds of, and which is sort of funny because you would think, well, what's the big deal? But often that becomes some of the largest controversies about biblical theology and study are when people get nitpicky or really details that they're not demanding, right? And so, like because of almost sort of the summation nature of this, to your point, this is over. I mean, it ends with Job dying in old age 140 years later. So in the last two verses, 140 years passes, right? Um, but the details of that are, you know, they give us some, but I think in this case, it's just enough to know this was a real thing. It did, it did happen, but like knowing exactly how that happened and who was who, like there are no names given and all that, like that's not the, the point. Okay, uh, Ron. Where does God talk about this huge monster, this huge animal? Oh, oh Leviathan. Leviathan. Yeah. Yeah, why is it a, a proper noun? So, so the um, they're often thinking with the Bahamut is often thought to be talking about a hippopotamus because uh, it fits with some of the descriptors that are being given. Um, but he's using like. Um, big language for like, like this is a great beast that, that I have created and I order its days and its steps and all of this. The Leviathan's a little trickier because there's a part in it where it turns into sort of the great uh, serpent description of Satan. Um, and that's similar to how he's described in Revelation. Um, so not exact, they're not exactly sure. I mean, the, the, the Leviathan doesn't refer to like a particular Earth, earth creature, um, but no. but I mean, at the time they believed that. I mean, there's a lot of mythologies related yes. to sea monsters, essentially, yes. right? Which is, and so I think going in the Old Testament, you do have references to some of these, which you know we don't have a modern like scientific answer. Oh, this is one. It, it, this is like Jules Verne, right? And the and the and the. The giant squid attacking the submarine, right? I mean, it's like this unspeakable, unthinkable monster in the depths that they all have, I think, very vividly in their minds, right? Because right. the ocean then was relatively unknown. You know, if you went out into the ocean and you lost sight of land, you were you were done. I mean, you well, it was that when oceans oceans uh, were commonly used as the image of like darkness and chaos and the unknown, which is also the role that Satan plays in the structure of. The cosmos and Christianity. He's sort of the chaos that disrupts the order that God desires to bring. And so the, there's this overlap there with the, the king of that chaos, the unknown, the Lord, the lordly creature that even that is under my dominion. Right. Um, so that's sort of the, the purpose of those those two illustrations there. Yeah. And then we got uh, I'll do Jim and then we gotta move on to the thinking back on what you were saying about how they weren't giving a lot of description in his restoration. They did get incredibly detailed with his daughters. They named them and said they also got an inheritance along with their brothers. In a male yeah, patriarchal fun. society, is there any 
thing that you came across in your commentaries as to why they would have made such a big deal as to the details of the thumbs? No, I didn't. Okay. I'm not sure if there's a... I think they're being used as as an illustration for his prosperity because it also specifically mentions that they're all extremely beautiful. So the like there I think there's still all kind of proxy details for God is restoring all the fortunes of Job, even more so than they were before. Gotcha. Gotcha. Because I don't I don't remember reading anything that came out of that whole last section. All right, and Jim had one. Yeah, I just want to ask. I mean, this whole thing started with Satan and God having this interaction. Yeah. And was, did Job obviously validate God's faith in him? Yep. And because uh, what what Satan contended was that Job would curse God and stop believing in him. And Job he questions God and he questions why things are happening to him. And you could even say that he questions God in an improper manner, but he's still directing all of his focus on God because he believes God is the person who's in control of this. So he's simultaneously for Job, the reason why he's suffering, but also the source of his relief and solution. So while, while he's working in and flexing on him and doing all this stuff, at some part he's proud too, right? And obviously that's yeah. Proof. Well, I mean, the, probably the, the way that you can tell the most about how God feels about Job is that he descended to speak with him, right? even though Job was like in error. He didn't lose his faith in God, but he was, he was, he was confused as to where he was to go and, and how this all worked. Right? And so God, I mean, descends and speaks with Job, addresses his concerns. And the, the proper answer to his concerns, which sometimes is the proper answer to ours, is a humbling. Like, this isn't your arena. This is outside of your depth. This is my area. And then I'm going to show you all the things that are in here so that you know you just leave it to me. Right? And so in Lutheran theology, this is most commonly taught in the form of if you are worried or anxious or unsure about unknown things, what do we then point you to? Well, some of those unknown things are God. So, uh, Job, even all the things that he were unknown, his faith was so strong, it didn't diminish his faith. Sure. His faith but we have, so now we have an even more complete answer from God in Jesus. And what does Jesus point us to? Hmm? Yeah, but he does that very specific. If I just say, like, if you feel like your suffering is coming from God, and I just say, well, look to God, that's not going to do much for you. The scriptures. Huh? The word. The word, right? The revealed part of God. So the parts that God has given us specifically. So if you're doubting whether or not you're saved, I'm going to point you to what? The word. And the word in a very specific place. The cross. No. Somebody just had it happen to them yesterday. Uh, baptism. Because in baptism, God spoke a known and complete promise to you. You're mine. I claimed you as my own. So when you're feeling like you don't, you're unworthy and you're not claimed, then I'm going to point you to the known things of God, the things he's revealed about himself to us. Right? So you're technically correct, but just saying to God is too vague for somebody who's in suffering, especially if they think God is part of the problem. Right, so if I just say to God, they're going to be like, "What does that mean?" Right, but if I say if in your baptism, strong, if, you, if your faith is so strong, like Job said, huh? and all the things that he went through, tribulation, yeah, he still had that faith. Right, but he needed to be he needed to be pointed to something. Right, that's what God is doing, and in in, in God's answer, He's pointing to Himself. Right, right. and so right. in Jesus, God is pointing to Himself as well. But he's doing it in even more specific ways that are easy for us to grasp. Because there are aspects about God that we don't know, that are unknown, right? Like, how does the Trinity work? Well, I don't know, right? Um, so is it three gods or one God? Well, it's three persons and one God. That's what he said. So I'm going to take him at his word, right? Um, and so when you're in a moment of crisis or anxiety about the unknowns of God or the unknowns of your life in relation to God, like Job is here, like, why did this happen? Why did I lose all my stuff? Why are my kids dead? Why did my wife leave me? Right? 
in those moments, like if somebody, God forbid, somebody here goes through something similar to that, what I'm going to do is not bring my word to counsel, I'm going to bring God's, and I'm going to point to the specific things where he's interacting with him. You know, that's part of the gift of the church, right? Part of the gift of the church is when you're doubting, I could say, were you baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yeah. You're a child of God. God made that promise to you. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. And, it, well, and you're pointing to where God himself is leading you. Right? He did those things for your benefit. Right? He doesn't have to give you a promise attached to a physical element at a particular time and place, but he does. And he does so that as the hymn, as one of my favorite hymns says, you can say, I'm God's own child. I gladly say that I'm baptizing the Christ. Get behind me and say, drop your ugly accusation. I'm a baptized child of God, right? And not, and you're, you're basing your faith in that, like Job is now doing, not in your ability to understand why he's done that, but the fact that he has spoken. He's the one that's making that reality, right? He's faithful. Okay. Great discussion. Book of Job. Done. We've mastered it. <laughs> um, okay. So before we move on to the means of grace portion of, uh, if you have your catechisms, you can open to page 281. Prepare for that. Uh, what is our next biblical literacy reading? So we're going to do another book of the Bible. What's the next one? What, is, what do you guys want to do? Proverbs. So we got a Proverbs book. Okay. You guys like Proverbs? Want to do Proverbs? All right. That was easy. Proverbs it is. All right, we'll start doing Proverbs. Um, let's see here. I don't know how many chapters are there. Yeah, huh? I'll just think about how I'm going to divide it up. Yeah, there's quite a few. Well, this one will be a bit different from like a book like Job because Proverbs is not all one narrative. It's not all one narrative in each chapter. Right. <laughs> so we might change our approach on this one. 31 chapters. Okay. Well, let's start with our customary 10 chapters. So we'll read chapters 1 through 10. And if it turns out that's just a train wreck for having a discussion the next week because it's way too many things. They're all scattered about. We can always adjust it down. Well, we could go up to uh, before the, the Proverbs actually start on in chapter eight or so, right? There's a long introduction. So maybe we could divide it. Oh, that's right there. Hmm. I forget. It's eight or seven or eight or nine. Is there a um, I think yeah, it's chapter, chapter 10 is the start. So we do one, one through nine. So we do one through nine. So Proverbs one through nine for next, next week. So we're all going to get wise. All right. But even our wisdom will be considered foolishness. Well, it's not going to be our wisdom that makes us wise. It's where we read the Bible. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> now we're on the means of grace. What's our what's our time here? It's twelve two. Okay, great job, guys. <laughs> this Bible study isn't about Job. <laughs> okay. I should have known that was going to take a while because that's the big question, like solution at the end. Yeah. Um, okay, so this, that's okay. This is sort of an introduction to our next section. We're going to be focusing on the means of grace primarily through the sacraments. So we'll be going into baptism starting next week. But we have a phrase that talks about that sort of form of theology that we, we refer to as the means of grace. And there's something important in that phraseology. Okay, um, what, are we, what are we saying when we talk about means of grace? What do those words mean? The way it happens, right? So we're making specific claims about how God brings his grace to us. It's not some amorphous like thing out there, but it's given specific travel, specific location, specific time, and specific instructions. Now, whose time, place, and instructions are they? Are they ours? Did we come up with them? No. We believe these are from God, which is why 
from to the outside world, sometimes it seems like we're splitting hairs. But we're really not. We're very concerned with doing the way that God wants his grace to be given. We're handling his gifts to us the way he intends them. That is an important thing. So just a, for a simple illustration, I, I like calling communion the Lord's Supper because it's a possessive phrase and it reminds me it's not my table, it's not my meal. So therefore, I don't get to set the rules. I have to follow the rules because the host is God. So if you want to think of that in human terms, imagine going to your friend's house and changing the course of the meal they've set for you and rearranging the furniture in their room. Is that proper behavior or is that rude? It's rude and you probably won't get invited back. Right? Um, so it turns out that it makes a difference whose table it is and the way that they want things ordered. Right? Because um, the consequences are much more dire than just not being invited back to somebody's house if you don't pay attention to those things. So the means of grace is a phrase that we use to signify that we believe God for our benefit has limited himself in certain ways to bring us specific gifts of grace that we can understand, refer to, and remember. So, for example, when you're baptized, one of the things that the church makes for you is what? Well, the church doesn't do that. We do something to help you remember that it occurred. What do we give you? A candle, yeah, but a candle's not going to give you any information 20 years later. Nope. Certificate. You get a certificate that is signed by the pastor who's saying in his signature, I baptized you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's witnessed by parents and attested to by sponsors, and it's an official document. That's one of the official acts of the church. And we call it that because let's say that um, by the time you're 75, you have no family, and you're losing your mind, and maybe your faith comes in crisis, and you're doubting, well, I don't know if I was baptized. I can't remember. I was baptized when I was a kid, I think, but I don't know. Somebody can show you that certificate and you know you're baptized. That's the purpose of having this sort of weirdly material side to these rituals is so that you know they actually happened and they happened to you at a particular time and in a particular place. That's one of the weird things about our God. He comes into history and does things in particular times in particular places. Right? Jesus wasn't in all the world at once. He was in a particular place in the world doing a particular way. And so we believe that he didn't stop working in that manner when he established the church. Yeah. Did you say that our baptism is the time of our justification? Um, so for children, yes. Um, for an adult believer, it's a little grayer um, because like the only thing that's described as like ultimately salvific in the scriptures is faith in Christ crucified. Um, which like can happen before you're baptized. Um, but usually there's a false opposite put up in people's mind. They're like, well, if I believe, then why do I need to be baptized? Well, because it's commanded by God. That's why. That's the short answer. But even though it's commanded by God, it, uh, there are places in the New Testament where people uh, you know, were, were saved without that baptism. Yes. Um, but only right, but only in like all of those are extraordinary circumstances. There's nobody described. Well, so this is good to talk about because it's one of the things that people really draw an emphasis on, and I think it's really misplaced emphasis. That it's not like your discussions about baptism should not be consumed with is it necessary in this really specific situation where I just heard about Jesus and then five seconds later I got killed. Because right, that's basically the only example from the scriptures where somebody believes it isn't baptized. The, all the other examples are as soon as they recognize their faith or as soon as somebody shares God's word with them, their reaction is essentially the same as the Ethiopian eunuchs. Is there any reason I can't be baptized right now? Right. That's why when, when the, the, the Roman prison, the guard who was going to kill himself because there was an earthquake and all the, sh the cells open, and he thought they left and he was going to die, so he's going to kill himself. And they don't leave, and Paul preaches the word to him, and then he and all of his household were baptized. Right? So that is, for us as Christians, regardless of what sort of conversation we get into about the 
particular situations, the progress and the sort of the program that we've been given by God as a church is someone expresses faith, like they express a faith in the word that's been preached and expresses a desire to be baptized, you, you baptize them, like immediately. Um, that's why we practice baptizing babies, because parents have the authority to speak on their children's behalf when it comes to matters of faith. That's part of the authority structure that God set up with parents and children, um, which is why, sorry to break it to you, any grandparents out there, if your kids aren't believers and you try to smuggle their grand, your grandchildren here and want me to baptize them against their parents' will, I will not do that because you don't have the authority to do that. Right out of Archie Bunker. Oh, well, <laughs> um, but if you don't want your child to be baptized, let's say they're 12 or 13, and they come to me and they want to be baptized, I'll baptize them because at that point they're speaking for themselves and ain't nobody going to get between them and Jesus. What if, what if an infant or very young child is baptized by a pastor without the parent's will or um, authority? He's operating outside of his, his call there. Because he doesn't have the authority to make that decision on behalf of the child. That's a that that's uniquely been given to parents. You know, so we so so that's the way that works. Um, so um, we got a little on track there. Okay. Question number two: Why does the catechism include baptism, confession, and office of the keys and the sacrament of the altar? So why are these all included? in Because Remember, Luther's goal with the catechism, the small catechism, was to distill the Christian faith down to its most basic principles. Because those are the way God reaches us. Very good. Those are the way that God has chosen to reach out to us. Right? So our primary concern as Lutherans, and really it should be the primary concern of all Christians, is what does God want the church to do? Right? So the reason that um, we do readings in the, in the service. But like sometimes the readings are long. Sometimes it might be hard to pay attention to the long readings. Hey, we might get more people coming to our church if we did less readings. Because maybe that's the reason. Maybe I just think it's so boring. I just can't stay here. Um, I'm not ever going to take the readings out. Why? It's a means of grace. And if there's anything that's removed from the service, it better not be the part that God is doing. <laughs> right? What? Right. Right. Well, the work and the worship service is divided into things we do and things God does. Right. That's that's the back and forth of worship. So you're you're going down the wrong path if you start taking out the things that God is doing. Then you're gonna have an interaction like Job. Like, who are you to decide how this works? This isn't yours mine right uh, and and my job is to continually remind myself of that luther has a sacristy prayer that i have i have it up in, in our sacristy and i pray it before the service at times and one of the things it says is that you have called me to be a bishop in your church and i'm very glad that it's not up to me because if it was i would have ruined everything a long time ago he literally said that. i would have ruined everything a long time is a reminder that like what you're doing in the, as the pastor, we'll get into that in the office of the keys, but what you're doing as a pastor is not like your work. You're called to an office that carries out the work that God has given the church. And it's specific for a reason. I mean, think about how long the church has been in existence. If you give somebody vague instructions, what do you think is going to happen over the course of 2,000 years? Telephone picture, right? What started as a Taco Bell is going to be like, somebody throwing a banana on the sidewalk. Have you ever played that game? But, I mean, so he gave us specific things. Yeah, Jim. You talked about not removing God's part yeah. of the service. When did people stop doing communion every week? Like, when did it start becoming every other week? That's a great question. Um, so that was sort of a, I have not heard a compelling theological argument for why you would do that. <laughs> the only argument I've heard is that it makes it more special. Um, but your feeling about communion is not what makes communion special. Um, God makes communion special and it does the thing which he sends it to do, right? Same with his word. So, um, so yeah. The, historically, I think it really happened after the Reformation when the church was splitting 
and you had all kinds of different opinions about what the Lord's Supper actually was, particularly among uh, people who followed like Zwingli and Calvin. Uh, they believed that it wasn't a literal sacrament. And so over time, if you don't think it's a literal sacrament, it would make sense that you're not, you, there's no need to do it every week because it's not doing something in and of itself. It's a mental exercise to remember or some other variation. Of the term. Uh, my previous church that I served did it every week. My own congregation did it. It's becoming the more common Lutheran practice. The, the Lutheran church was really largely affected in the West by a very anti-Catholic sentiment. And so there are a lot of, like, that's a reason there are some congregations you'll never hear chanting because there were members of that church that chanting equals Catholic and we're not Catholic, so we're not chanting. And that was as far as the logic went. Um, and similar community practices are fairly similar in that. And that's not without merit, but it shouldn't dictate your behavior over a long period of time. It's crucial that we constantly remember that it is the same God, regardless of whether you're uh, Protestant or Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or no matter what, as long as you're Trinitarian, you're part of the same church. Also, yes, that's so crucial. But often. I'm not going to push back against that as far as content goes, but I'm going to push back against the sentiment. Because I think your goal primarily is you want people to go to a place where you believe the word is being followed and preached most faithfully. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that you are condemning people who don't go to the one that you agree with, which is, I think, the sentiment you're trying to express, right? That, well, my buddy goes to a Baptist church, <laughs> he's done. Right? No, we don't believe that. Right? But if I'm going to talk to somebody who's a non-believer, I'm not going to pretend like the only reason I'm at the Lutheran church is because they have the best potluck and I like the people. Because that's disingenuous. Like, I'm, well, <laughs> but really the reason you're here, my, my different supervisor and pastor had a really good way of expressing this. He says, I'm here because I believe this is where Jesus is most clearly present, preached, and taught. If you go somewhere and you think he's more clearly taught somewhere, Come and tell me because that's where I want to be. Okay. I haven't found. It. That's why I'm here. So I think that I like that expression of it because you're you're not you're not like you know ruling out that they could end up going to a different church. If they do, great. And you should celebrate that, as you said. Right? But don't don't jump to that before having them understand, like, because I would think it's a pretty natural question for them to say, well, then why do you go to this church and not that one? And even if they don't ask you, they're thinking that in their head when you're talking. And so you might as well say, well, like, you know, I go to the Lutheran church because I believe it's it's the most faithful explanation of the scriptures, the faithful, most faithful iteration of the church. And so I'm not going to pretend that I would I would really like you to be a part of that, not because you can join my club, it's not my club, right? Um, but so that you're most clearly receiving the gifts that God wants you to get through his church. But if you end up going to a Baptist church, you're still receiving gifts from our understanding, right? You're still hearing the word. But you're being deprived of the sacraments, which is, you know, not the like you're not totally screwed per se, but it's less good in that sense. Um, okay, let's finish these last two real quick. Um, what is a sacrament? So sacrament, we have our definition of sacrament, which you, you'll find on page 282. What is a sacrament? The Lutheran Church usually speaks of a sacrament as a sacred act that's A, instituted by the command of Christ, B, in which Christ joins his word of promise to a visible element, right? So baptism, the word of promise is joined to water, and communion, the, the word of promise is joined to bread and wine, very good. And C, by which he offers and bestows the forgiveness of sins he has earned for us by his suffering, death, and resurrection, right? This last one, and really the second one too, are why confirmation, marriage, penance, and confession are not considered sacraments. They're good things. They're good spiritual practices, and they're things God intends to use to bless you, but they're not sacraments because they're not salvific, and they're not God joining his word of promise to visible elements. So that's why we have two sacraments. Salvific. salvific they're not they don't uh, they don't create salvation they don't they don't work towards salvation so 
According to our belief, when you're baptized, you are made a child of God by him, right? I don't do the work. You don't do the work, right? It's not a public confession of faith for you. It's a public confession of faith from God that you are his, which is why it's a comfort. If it was your public confession, it wouldn't offer much comfort, right? Um, which is why if you believe that way about it, you also get rebaptized a lot. Because, well, I fell away from the faith and I came back and I need to be baptized again because I broke my promise to God. And we would say, you do not. If you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he made a promise to you and he's always faithful. So he is the old man, father from prodigal son. And while you're coming up with your speech about how you can be a servant, he's hugging you and throwing a robe on you and throwing a party because his son is alive. Right. Um, okay, and then the last one, does our faith make the sacrament? No. It does not. What does our faith do? It um, strengthens the sacraments? Sort of. Huh? They do. That's what the sacraments do for your faith. But what does your faith do in the sacraments? It doesn't make them efficacious. Um, not quite. Believe that they are efficacious. Yes. You believe that they are efficacious. So the warning for Paul in First Corinthians 11, which we'll spend some time on when we get there, is talking about that reality that. If you're eating this, not in faith, it's not that you're not receiving the body and blood of Jesus, but you're guilty concerning it because you have no faith in the promises that are being given. So you don't even really know what you're getting. And therefore, you're being deprived of the benefit that God intends it to be because you don't believe it. Right? So it's, it's this weird, it's almost like a splitting hairs thing, but it's really important. Because your feeling and faith when you're up there at the rail doesn't turn the body and blood into, or doesn't turn the bread and wine into the body and blood. Right? But you are deprived of all the benefits of receiving it because you don't believe that it's doing it. You're actually receiving it to your own heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is the reason we don't give it to everyone. Because it's actually not good for them in that situation. Right? They, we don't exactly know what it means to be guilty concerning the body of the Lord. I'm pretty sure it's not great. So we don't want that for you. <laughs> All right. Um, so just know that when you're when you're having like a friend come over and they go to church with you or a family member and they go to church with you and they, they have a different membership and a different confession of faith that we do not share worship fellowship with, for example. Or if they're an unbeliever and they're curious, they're not to have communion here, not because we don't want them to. We do want them to. But we want them to have communion when it will be good for them. And the scriptures tell us that if they don't believe in the promises of, of what's being given to them, it's a spiritual not good. It's not good for them spiritually. And so that's why I say that at the beginning of the service. It's not that I don't want people to come. I do. I want, I want everybody to come to the table. Right? We want everyone to be at the table. But like I said, I don't set the rules. Who does? He does. Right? So, all right. I know we're running over, but I, I am a little confused about this. Sure. Um, well, I'll just let me, before you say it, okay. this is a disclaimer. If you need to go, feel free to go guilt free. We're over time. So uh, we are welcome to stick around as long as we're answering questions here. But if you need to go, feel free to go. Okay, go ahead. So, so two problems I have. Number one is like I have a sister in law who is um, divorced. Okay. So she says she, she's Catholic. So she says she can never go to I don't believe that. So that's one thing that, but honestly, I've got to tell you, I, I'm struggling now because I have taken communion when I go to the Catholic Church only because uh, I just, I, I know, I know, and this whole room might think I'm wrong, and, and, and I probably am, but I, I feel so close. Like, when I'm at that table, like, I could cry thinking about, like, you did that for me. Yeah, yeah. And every time someone offers it, I want to go. I just sure. want to go. And I feel like you're telling me that's wrong. So here, here's what I'm telling you. So the first part of what you said, the reason that your sister-in-law. Sister-in-law, yeah. Yeah. So the reason your sister-in-law in the Catholic Church can't do that is because marriage is a sacrament. So we don't believe marriage is a sacrament, which is why we would disagree with you. Okay. Because marriage is like divorce is not an unforgivable sin. Like marriage was made for man, not man for marriage. Um, so 
So that's that difference there. The other thing is you're very, what you're very strongly feeling is the personal aspect of communion, as you should. It is an unbelievable and amazing thing that God is giving us to you. But communion is not just a private thing between you and God. It's also a public confession that you're participating in. So, for example, would you think it odd if you saw me taking communion at a Baptist church? So you're going to say... Yeah, Cheryl, that's odd. And I'm going to say, no, buddy, you just want to. So, so but what I'm doing by doing that is I'm affirming that church's public confession, which I do not agree with. All right. Because I'm, I mean, like, if you're doing something, so, like, that's why, like, if uh, if you say one thing but then do another, people are like, well, that doesn't make sense. Right? And so they don't believe that communion is the same thing we can do. And so what you're doing publicly is you're giving two public confessions that can't both be true. Right? And so it's not, it's not a like, a, it's not like if you do it, you're doomed personally because you've ingested poison or something like that. It's that it's actually causing confusion for others because your action is a witness to them about what you believe is going on. Which is why like I would actually get in trouble with the LCMS if I took communion or preached at a church that was not an altar and public fellowship with our church. Because I would cause confusion among the people who see me as their pastor. They'd be like, well, why are you over there saying that stuff when over here you're saying this stuff? Right? And that would be irresponsible of me to do so. And so there is a, um, there, and really you go back to the 40s and before, no one expected to take communion at anyone else's church. There was really never an expectation of that. That was largely influenced by our cultural movements of, of hate speech and social justice and like everybody, like basically the only argument that I've heard for withhold, for not withholding communion from people who don't share your profession basically boils down to the phrase, because it's me. There's no theological argumentation. It's a social argument about like hurt feelings. And sometimes we're called to do things that hurt people's feelings in the world because God is calling us to a new thing. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't want you to hear that as a, uh, this is a restriction in the sense of like, this is our club, it's not your club, and we don't want you here. What this is, is like communion is powerful. God is doing something amazing here, and he's given us instructions on how to do it so that it benefits you. And I want to make sure that when you take it, that's what happens. Because the Bible does tell us that if it's done in certain ways, it is not the blessing that is intended to be. And that somewhere got lost in the discourse, um, where a lot of times it was presented in this sort of my club, your club sort of thing. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Thank you for asking. That's a good question. Yeah, it's the exact same thing. I find it impossible to take a communion in the Catholic Church because of their view of transubstantiation. Yeah. Whereas we know that Christ is in us as we take communion, but we don't view that bread and that wine as Christ himself. You know, he becomes Christ in us. But what about the churches that say that the bread and wine represents Christ? Yeah. If they're saying it that way, and you have communion there, and you know that it's becomes him, even though they're saying it represents him, you know it becomes him. But again, your faith does not make the sacrifice. And so what you're doing there is like your your private interaction with God, like if they have all of the elements there can be genuine. But again, it's there's the public aspect as well, and you're sowing confusion because you are publicly like you're publicly declaring agreeing with your agreeing with this other belief group. Maybe you could depend on that sometimes. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I believe me, as a pastor, there's so many things that I would rather be able to tell you, I'm like, oh, go ahead. I don't care. Like, that would be way easier for me. But, but like that's what the word says. So that's what we are going to well, okay. So let's just let's just set it straight that like it's not like you're you're dooming yourself forever by doing this. But there's a reason that the the context of the meal, the breaking of the bread, 
is always within a worshiping community, like your worshiping community. Right? Um, I have to admit that when I was married, my wife was a Catholic church for a certain service. He was never taking communion. Because she would have killed me if I would have walked out there. And I went, about a month ago, I did go to communion. I probably shouldn't have. Well, one of the ways this was explained, one of the ways this was explained to me, uh, one of the ways this was explained to me that it's sort of it's simple and it's easy to remember is they're not offering you the same thing. Okay. It's a different thing. It's also a, an affront to Catholics. They want you to be a Catholic in good standing to receive communion. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really common, is it, this is a very generational issue because a lot of pastors my age are coming into churches where the pastor who was in their 50s to 70s that either retired or moved on practiced open communion at their LCMS church for two decades. I even know a guy who got run out of a congregation over that and he did it, he, he wasn't like a jerk about it, but they just were so set against that idea and it, it, it was even written in their own church constitution they were violating their own church constitution for 20 years and if you want to believe that fine but just don't be an lcms church anymore because if you're going to call an lcms pastor they're going to be trained in a different way of uh, and it's just not good for either so i mean i'm happy to talk about this at length with anybody who, who wants to we're going to get into that more detail on that when we get to that section of the catechism but that is really one of the things I think that has caused a lot of confusion and um, and issues between our denominations, and especially within the context of friends and family, because we all have friends and families that are of different different beliefs. So I have to admit, I was a Catholic, never knew what the sacraments were. I didn't know if I was breaking into the kingdom or not. I didn't know that until I got here. Right. Yeah. There's a lot, there, that's that's true in every denomination. There are lots. There are lots of people who go and do stuff at church, and they don't fully understand what it's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. 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 Right. So, the, well, the reason that that confusion arose is our culture is hyper individualistic. And so what ended up happening with the Christian faith is over, over time, influenced by that, it became all about me and Jesus. And so if it's just about you and Jesus, it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks, what everybody else sees, because it's just you and him. And so that belief Made, it made sense that it's, it attached itself very strongly to community because that is an element of community. Like that, that's one of the great comforts of community is we're not, I'm not saying Jesus died on the cross for everyone. I'm saying take and eat body of Christ given for you. So there's a deeply personal and specific aspect to it. But it's also, a, there's also a public confession of faith that you're making because you're not doing that in the closet. Right? You went to a church that says a specific thing about it. And you went up there with all of them, and you partook of that. And the word communion literally means with oneness. Right. So you're you're declaring oneness with the other people at the table. Right. In terms of well, and, and it makes sense if you think about it in a different context. Imagine if next week you showed up to church, and I decided I'm going to do communion, even though I don't normally do communion on the second Sunday of the month. And I'm going to do grapes, grape juice, and potato chips. <laughs> How would you feel about that? You want to be a part of that? I think Sammy would be pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> why, why would you not be happy with that? Is it is it against tradition? Where did that tradition come from? Well, that's the last supper. Like, yeah. yeah, right? It so it turns out you do actually care about the particulars. Yeah. So the, the sort of the nature of this is, and this will become the last opportunity pretty over time, is that you can't pick and choose where the details matter when it's not your dinner. It's his dinner, right? It's his table. And he's given us the way in which we are to do it. And so I can't say, like, I'm not allowed, I can't, like, well, similar to the, the Job and God relationship, right? I can't then dictate to him, well, I like this part, but this part I'm not a big fan of, so I'm going to, I'm going to shave the corners off of that, or I'm going to change that. 
Um, so that's where our stance is famously just the words, right? Luther famously, when he was meeting with Zwingli, they agreed on pretty much everything except for this issue. And the, the story goes that Luther just carved the word is into the table and then said nothing. Because that's what it says. This is my body. So it's really his body. And his stance was, that's the guy who rose from the dead. So I'm going to take his word for it. I'm not going to go into any sort of mental gymnastics to make those words mean something else to coincide with my reason. I don't know how it works, but it is his body and blood. So that's what we're going to do. And that's that's essentially our stance. Um, so, and this is this this applies to broader things than just communion. It's it's really related also to our understanding of the scriptures in general. I can't pick and choose which scriptures I like and don't like, and which to keep and not to keep. So, like especially like on those Sundays where I read the gospel reading, and at the end it's like, whoa, that was rough. And I still have to say praise to you, O Christ. Yeah, it's His word. It's all good, but some of them are rougher than others, right? Like, wouldn't it be nicer if I could say something other than, like, you're going to hate your, like, if it comes between me and your father and your brother and brother's sister, hate them and choose me. But he says that. So I got to tell you that because that's what he says. It's not my show. It's this. Right. Um, so, so once again, we'll get into the, some of the more, more uh, great details of that when we get to that section. Because um, I, I didn't, I didn't prepare for that discussion. So I'll, I'll get some scripture references and um we'll talk more about that again. but thank you for sharing those i mean i know that's like a deeply personal thing and uh it involves family friction and friend friction and all of that and that's difficult but our goal is the truth of god's word and so that's our that's our main objective in those discussions and the way we live our life as the church so that's what we're going to be evaluating those things all right let's just close with the lord's prayer our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Have a good week.